Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours at Sea. Uh, the noise is probably a little different, or the audio is a little bit different uh, today, because as you can see, we are flying along in the Pacific Ocean. Pacific? Pacific Ocean. I had to stop and think about that one. Uh, going from San Francisco up to Juneau, Alaska. It's my second cruise of the year and uh, really love Alaskan cruises. I think uh, cruise ships are the best way to see Alaska. You really see the grandness of the entire uh, state. So I st I'll stop here and take a few of your questions. Well, it's not like I'm gonna stop the boat, obviously. Top voted question is from DBA Cat. And DBA Cat has several things embedded in his question, but the first part is, what happens to statistics when a transaction is rolled back? I think what he means is if you're doing an insert, update, or delete inside a transaction, and for some reason that causes statistics to be updated, what happens with that? Well, stats get updated not when the inserts, updates, and deletes are happening, but when the select happens. SQL Server will let you make all kinds of changes to data, and there's not really a need to improve the statistics until you're done making changes and it's time to start reading that data. Generally speaking, most people don't do selects inside of a transaction. And if you did, it would seem like there's nothing really to roll back. Begin Tran, do a select, that select kicks off stats changes, that can be blocking. You wouldn't want the blocking to continue while your work is rolled back. So as far as I'm aware, and I, I could be wrong, I haven't tested this in a really long time. I know I have tested it, but like 10, 15 years ago, this uh, statistics updates aren't rolled back as part of transactions if they're just kicked off automatically due to a select. Uh, that would be easy for you to test, though, if you think that that behavior has changed inside SQL Server. Um, and that's one of my favorite pieces of advice from Paul Randall. Paul liked to say that if you could write a test to get an answer to your question within a minute or two, it's your job to write that test and learn it firsthand. That way you don't have to wait for anybody else for an answer, you don't have to pester them for an answer and so forth. But DBA Cat's question has a couple of other interesting pieces, so I'm going to continue. He continues on, he says, the query's execution plan didn't change, but duration and CPU jumped up. Okay, hold on a second here. Statistics are used to build the execution plan. So if you're saying that the execution plan didn't change, I don't think it's related to what was happening with statistics, unless of course it's blocking. If we're waiting on that stats update to finish before we can kick off our execution plan. And that is at the heart of what I think the problem is that you were facing at that one time. What I think happened was that you were running something and the select required an update of statistics before it could continue. Duration and CPU would look like they were higher, but they were higher due to the fact that you were updating statistics. That would be most likely included in whatever measurements you were looking at, depending on the tool that you were using. To get around that, SQL Server has an uh, update stats async setting that you can set at the database level so that if you want your, your queries to be able to continue to run with bad stats while a stats update is kicked off in the background, that might be what you're looking for there. Next question, a uh, whiny app developer asks, Hi Brent, a well-intentioned index has been added to our apps database, and my friend can see that it has caused one query to slow down. The team aren't sure when the index was added or what it might have been sped up. What's your opinion on DBAs making changes without informing the apps team? What makes you say it was a DBA? 
you just told me you don't know when it was done. What makes you think it was a DBA? So let's step back a little bit and stop playing the blame game. Let's start thinking about, okay, should anyone be allowed to add indexes in production without going through some kind of change control? And it's probably not. You probably don't want people making changes to production without getting everybody else on the team to be on the same page. Now, in terms of the troubleshooting is what queries it makes faster and which ones it makes slower, you can learn more about that in my Fundamentals of Index Tuning class, where I talk about how it's totally normal for new indexes to speed up some queries and make some queries worse. But really, what you're asking about there is change control, and don't go into it pointing fingers. Just say that you want to get to the root of the problem by reducing the number of people who are allowed to make changes in production. It may not even be DBAs. Uh, Radu DBA says, I don't necessarily have a question. Okay, great. He says, but I need some encouragement and emotional support. For me, you come to me for emotional Do you know me? Really? Because my company still uses SQL Server 2000 and they don't want to migrate since the app still works fine. Okay, so you're saying the application works and you need emotional support? You're not going to find it here. If you want the business to make changes to an application that works, you've got to tell them how it's going to work better. What's going to be better about it after you convince them to make some kind of change? The sitting around and whining isn't going to get you what you want, including emotional support from me. Sorry, bucko. Uh, next up, I think some of these are related. Whiny DBA says, Hi, Brent. This is like related to an earlier whiny question. What is your opinion of developers that want total control of non-clustered index creation on production servers? There's a job that needs to be done. Someone has to manage index tuning. I don't give a damn who it is. Pick one team and make it their responsibility. Whiny DBA, it sounds like you want more work. Do you see this out here? This is called vacation. And you can't get here if you try to do everything in the company yourself. Right now, as we speak, Erica is dealing with all of the consulting sales at the company. Richie is dealing with all the application development. And I am completely and blissfully unaware of any of that because I am out here because I have learned to do something called delegate. And that is something that you need to be comfortable with as well. I know you think you're the only capable person in the entire company who's able to do a particular task. You are incorrect. Next up, Eduardo says, do you recommend any specific uh, Excel skills for production DBAs? No, doesn't make any difference to me there at all. Mars asks, hi Brent, what are your predictions for database administrators in the next 10 years? So there are two kinds of database administrators, <laughs> the good ones and the bad ones. No, that's not true. There are two kinds of database administrators, production DBAs, <coughs> excuse me, production DBAs who focus on doing things like uh, backups, uh, provisioning, security, uh, network configuration to make sure the apps can talk to the SQL servers, high availability, disaster recovery. They're basically making sure that the, the server runs period, and is safe and secure. The other kinds of database administrators that you have are called development DBAs. They focus on index tuning, uh, query tuning, performance monitoring, and some of you out there watching this are going, but I do everything. Yes, you're a jack of all trades. You work for a smaller company. You try to do everything. You don't necessarily do everything really well. You do everything, just not necessarily to a 400 level. 
production DBAs are going to be the ones who more of their work is eventually automated up in the cloud. Development DBAs, in theory, some of their stuff would be automated by stuff like Azure SQL DB automatically indexing tables. But as we've seen since that feature originally came out and kind of dive bombed, that's not really that and not really going to replace development DBAs jobs. So they'll both change in different ways. Development DBAs are going to change because the sprawl of data just never stops. The number of sprawl of tables never stops. And you're going to have to get better at automating pieces of your job, doing things like pulling index data with SP Blitz Index. Production DBAs have to get used to working in the cloud but the cloud still doesn't restore itself. The cloud still doesn't configure itself. The cloud still doesn't secure itself. All that work is still remaining to be done for production DBAs. Uh, next up, Arlo asks, what realistic options are available for implementing multi-master replication between multiple availability groups? I looked at peer-to-peer, -peer, but I'm not sure if it supports AGs. I have no idea because here's the thing. Every time, every single time that a client has brought me in and said, hey, we need two active data centers. We need to be able to write in two places at the same time. And I've said, why? And we start drilling down into it really quickly. It just comes down to, well, we don't want to have this other data center wasted. And then I show them how licensing works in SQL Server. You only have to really pay, and I'm simplifying this by a lot, you only have to really pay by where users can connect to, and you just doubled your licensing by writing to two places and reading from two places. And as soon as we look at the scale of that licensing, all of a sudden people go, oh, you know what? Maybe it's not so bad if we let that other data center sit by itself. If you believe you still do need it, by all means, go to brentozar.com, click consulting at the top of the site, and uh, I'll be glad to work with you and your company to set up a database strategy, assess your current environment, and then figure out what it is you really want that feature for, and we'll see whether or not you really need it. And then we'll do one more. Iljarn says, have you ever considered using PowerShell for SP Blitz? No. I mean, I'm, let me rephrase that. Yes, and I immediately said no, that I don't want to do it. So here's why. Most of the time I want something that's going to be as simple as possible that someone can just copy paste into the server and hit execute. And as soon as that happens with PowerShell, there are all kinds of tricky problems around how do you connect to the SQL server? How do you make sure that you have the rights that you need? How do you do all of these checks in PowerShell instead of in T-SQL? And all that stuff is just already taken care of in SP Blitz. I don't feel the need to reinvent the wheel. But I have always said to other people, if you feel like inventing the wheel, you feel free. The code in SP Blitz is MIT licensed. You're welcome to start with that and figure out how to adapt it to PowerShell. And over the years, I've had several people uh, who are like serious PowerShell users say, you know what, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it just so that I can show you. I'm gonna go sit down and I'll be back. And then they never came back. I'm like, yeah, it's, because why would you reinvent the wheel? If you're gonna build health checks in PowerShell, that's cool, but you don't really need to, to, to use SP Blitz for it. There are things like pester tests that you could run against your infrastructure that are probably an even better place to put that than PowerShell. All right, that about sums it up for this office hour. So it's funny, this is the first time that I'm using this camera. I just bought a Sony ZV-E1 camera. And uh, one of the things that's cool about it is it has artificial intelligence where it will recognize uh, where I'm standing and it'll reframe automatically so that I can move around from place to place uh, and the camera will follow me. The camera doesn't actually move on a, a, an axis or whatever. Uh, it's just using different parts of the sensor and zooming in and out automatically. 
I'll be curious to see what the uh, end result of it looks like. I'm really excited to try it in the kinds of places where when I film office hours, I'm standing up because when I stand up, then it makes it much easier for me to move around from place to place and have the camera follow me around. So it's kind of nifty how that works. Thanks for hanging out with me and I will see y'all on the next office hours. Adios.